Hello, Agatville Baptist Church. Hello, visiting friends. This is Brother Jim uh, coming to you from uh, an unknown parts, just like you are housed in your in your shelter uh, through this uh, coronavirus pandemic. So am I, and uh, it's just so good to be able to communicate with you and you with me through all the technology that God has uh, blessed us with in these days. So uh, I want to thank Brother Steve Steinhilber for setting this system up so that we could share this way. Brother Steve has been bringing messages for many weeks to us this way, and they've been a blessing. And uh, I just uh, thank you, Steve, for that. I also want to thank all of you who are visiting our Facebook page and uh, and uh, our YouTube channel and are allowing us to minister to you and you minister to us in that way. Uh, though this has been a very challenging time in our nation's life, I think it's brought some good things to light and and we thank God for that. Well, I want to pray with you and then uh, open up the Word of God to you in Acts chapter 2. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your care, your provision and your protection, your comfort and your help during hard times. We pray, Father, for those who are experiencing special difficulty during this time. We pray that you would be close to them and, and that they would know it and that they would look to you uh, for your help and your grace. We pray for our president and our leaders, Lord, our governor and mayors and, and all those who are trying to navigate these waters. We pray that you would heal our land, Lord, of, of its divisions and especially, Lord, of its sin. And, and Father, when you have done what you designed to do through this time, I pray that we might all be more like Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us today. Even though we can't be with one another in a physical way, we can be in this way. And thank you that you're always with us. And uh, especially when we gather around your word and meet in your name. We thank you for all the blessings you've given. Thank you for he hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, turn, uh, if you have your Bible, to Acts chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, may God forgive your sin-sick soul. <laughs> no, I'll read, I'll read the passage. You remember last week we talked about uh, this sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was uh, 49 days, seven weeks after Passover, after the day that Jesus died. Now, Jesus uh, remained here teaching the apostles for 40 days after his resurrection. And so this is just a little over a week since they have last seen Jesus. And they're gathered together, uh, maybe in that upper room, uh, maybe in the temple districts. Uh, Luke just says in Acts chapter 2, they were all in one place. We're not sure where that was. But as they prayed and as they talked to get together about uh, what was ahead, all of a sudden, God's Holy Spirit filled the room. It was, it was uh, an event like none other. Uh, a mighty rushing wind sound came and tongues of fire came and lit on uh, well, fire came, and then it separated into tongues and lit on every individual believer in that place, 120 of them. It was as if to say that we are all uh, baptized by one spirit into one body, the body of Christ. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And then they all began to speak the praises of God, but not in their native language. All of them began to speak in other languages that they had never learned. And because it was a feast day, the Pentecost, uh, 
there were Jews from all over the world there, and they began to hear the apostles and the others uh, speak the praises of God and the wonders of God in their native language. And they said, how can this be? Aren't these Galileans? How, how is it that we hear the praises and the wonders and the greatness of God in our own language? From Rome and Parthia and Greece and, and Spain and everywhere, they were hearing uh, worship and praise and witness in their own language. And some said, well, these people are obviously drunk. Peter stood up and, and said, men of Israel, hear me. We're not drunk with wine, as some of you are mockingly saying. Why? And then he says something interesting. He says, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, you've heard that song, well, it's five o'clock somewhere. They weren't saying that. They, they were saying, this is the spirit of God that Joel prophesied would come upon all flesh, upon all God's children, sons and daughters of God. And they would prophesy and they would witness and they would preach. And so well, we looked at that sermon, especially beginning at verse 22 last Sunday. And we looked at it from the uh, point of view of what the resurrection of Jesus authenticates. And if you'll recall, we said that it authenticates the scriptures of God because uh, Peter uh, went back to Psalm 16, where David had said, you will not leave my soul in Sheol or in the grave. You will not allow my body to see corruption. And Peter said, but that couldn't have been uh, of David. That couldn't have been prophesying something of David, but David, being a prophet, foresaw that God would raise Jesus from the dead. And, and so the resurrection of, of uh, Christ authenticates the scriptures of God. This prophecy, prophecy written a thousand years before Jesus by David foretold that God would raise Jesus up from the dead and not suffer him to see corruption. And so it authenticated the scriptures of God, we saw. And then it authenticated uh, the, uh, the, or the sovereignty of God. Actually, that was the first thing, the sovereignty of God. Because Peter said, this Jesus that, that God approved of and God proved that he was uh, his son by the miracles that he Created, which you all saw, God sent Jesus, approved him, put his seal of approval on him by his miracles. You, by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. But then he says, but it was all according to the plan and the foreknowledge of God. It did not take God by surprise. Jesus knew from the start that he was born to die. He said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I have come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. And so, uh, even though it was a wicked thing, God is sovereign. God overrules. God overturns. God has his way in spite of our wickedness. And so, the resurrection authenticated the sovereignty of God and the scriptures of God, and it authenticated the Savior of God. And Peter says, um, so, so be assured that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. And we talked about that word Christ. It means anointed. And it speaks of the fact that Jesus is God's prophet, priest, and king. And the resurrection authenticated all of that. But dear friends, the resurrection only authenticates those things if it happened. So what we want to look at today is, yes, the resurrection does authenticate all of that if it's true. But what authenticates the resurrection? So let's continue our reading in Acts chapter 2. And Peter has just... Uh, 
just spoken of David's prophecy in Psalm 16, and he says, uh, Therefore, he being a prophet, in verse 30, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. And so, what authenticates the resurrection? The scriptures do. And I don't mean the scriptures in the New Testament that give the account. I mean the Old Testament scriptures that prophesied that this would happen. Psalm 16 maybe is the best uh, example of that. That's the one Peter uh, quoted. And so there were so many things told in the Old Testament what to expect when God would send his Savior, his Messiah, to save the world. And one of the things was that he would die, but he would rise again. He would come back to life. So the scriptures authenticate the resurrection. If, uh, if the resurrection did not happen, then it is the only thing that the Old Testament prophesied about Jesus that didn't come true. The Old Testament tells us that Jesus would be the seed of a woman in Genesis 3.15, that he would be virgin born in Isaiah 7.14, that he would be born in Bethlehem in Micah 5.2, that he would die uh, a, a death that pierced his hands and pierced his feet in Psalm 22, that he would be led as a, a, a sheep to her shearers and he wouldn't say a word in Isaiah 53 that he would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace would be put on him. All of these things came true. If the resurrection that was foretold in Psalm 16 did not come true, then it was the only thing about Jesus' life that failed to live up to the prophecy. By the way, the Old Testament tells us also that he will come and every eye will see him and even those who crucified him will mourn because of him. They will see him and he will. He will come again. So the scriptures authenticate the resurrection. Then uh, Peter goes on and says, he foreseeing this spoke of the resurrection of Christ that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Peter said there's 120 of us here, and we are all witnesses of this. Now, he doesn't just mean uh, to witness like you and I might witness to someone uh, concerning the truth of the gospel message. He means I'm a witness like I was a witness of a bank robbery or I was a witness of a hit and run accident. I am a witness and we all are witnesses of the resurrected Christ. Now, uh, not only is the resurrection authenticated then by the scriptures of God, but it is authenticated by the sight of God's people. They saw him. They saw him die on a cross. Uh, some few brave women saw him wrapped in grave clothes and weighted down with spices and laid in a borrowed tomb. And by the way, aren't you glad Jesus could borrow a tomb? He didn't need it forever. They saw him die. They saw him dead and placed in a tomb. They were witnesses of that. But glory to God, they were witnesses of something else. They were witnesses of a resurrected Jesus, that he came out of the grave. He wasn't there when, when they went to the grave. He wasn't there. Now, witnesses can be mistaken. And sometimes 
uh, critics have tried to uh, explain the empty tomb by saying, well, they just went to the wrong tomb. They were mistaken. Or they hallucinated. They just expected Jesus to rise. They wanted it so badly that they hallucinated it. They, they made it up and their, their mind played tricks on them. Well, if there wasn't an empty grave, if they just went to the wrong grave, all the Jews would have to do, all Pontius Pilate's soldiers would have to do, is say, come here, you've gone to the wrong grave, roll the stone away, see his dead and corrupting body. They couldn't do that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I'm going away and you're going to look for me and you will not be able to find me. He said that to the Jewish religious leaders and believe me they looked they if they could have turned up that body they would have but the body was gone and and they were eyewitnesses so the resurrection is authenticated by the sight of God's people they saw him not only did they see him they touched him they handled him remember Thomas put your put your fingers in my uh, hand, Thomas, put your hand through my side and, and be not faithless, but believing. John says in 1 John chapter 1, that which we have seen and heard and handled with our hands, touched with our hands, that we declare to you. They saw him, they heard him, they touched him, they ate with him. Remember John 21, they had a, a fish breakfast with him. In another place, uh, they gave him some fish and honeycomb to eat. This was no hallucination. As a matter of fact, they were not in the frame of mind to, to hallucinate. Uh, they were not expecting this at all. And when the women came back from the grave and told them that the grave was empty, they thought they were crazy. There's something else about these eyewitnesses you should consider. A witness could be mistaken, but these weren't. And these are uh, witnesses who tell the story at the cost of their own life. Now, you might make up a religion and you might lie about some things, but you would have to have a motive. What was their motive? Was it, uh, was it to get rich? Well, they seriously miscalculated that. Silver and gold have I none, Peter said at the gate by the temple. Since, since I met Jesus, he said, I haven't had anything. They didn't do it for riches. Did they do it for fame? Certainly not, because they were considered the scum of the earth in their culture. They were persecuted. They were dogged. They were chased. Did they do it for comfort? Certainly not. All but one of them died a martyr's death because they preached this message and they would not recant. Because they knew. I saw him. By the way, the first eyewitnesses were not eyewitnesses that you would have made up. They were the women who went to the tomb. Now, I'm not saying this, and in our culture it's not so, but in that culture... A woman's witness was worth very little. Uh, they were not considered seriously. And so if you were going to make this up, you wouldn't have the women be the first ones to tell the story. You would have had some trustworthy man do it. Maybe Nicodemus. He was, he was uh, a Pharisee. He was respected. Why then do the Gospels say, that the women were the first ones. Well, obviously, because the women were the first ones. And this story is told in a truthful way. So, what authenticates the resurrection? The Old Testament scriptures, the scriptures of God, the sight of the people of God. Thirdly, the sending of the Spirit of God. Remember what had just happened when Peter stood up and said this. 
the Holy Spirit had come and lit upon all the people, and they began to do a miraculous thing. They began to do something they could not do without the Spirit of God. And so uh, Peter says, of this we're all witnesses, verse 33, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and being received and having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, what you now see and hear. He said, you, you have run up here, you have gathered a crowd around us because you saw something unusual and supernatural. You have seen the Spirit of God come upon us and us do supernatural things. And this proves that Jesus is no longer in the grave, that he has been ascended to the right hand of the Father and has sent his Holy Spirit as he promised he would do. And so, uh, the sending of the Spirit of God authenticates that Jesus is no longer in the grave, that Jesus is risen. I wonder if you are aware of the Spirit of God that lives within you, that God Almighty has come to take residence in your heart and life. If you're a Christian, if you believe the great good news that Jesus died for your sins and rose again, and that he offers you salvation full and free, if you would just turn from your sin and ask him to save you. If you've done that, he said he would come and live in you. And he does that through his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us a peace. The Holy Spirit gives us uh, the ability to obey God. The ability to love God and love his word and, and love doing his will. The Holy Spirit does for us what we could never do for ourselves. He prays for us. He, he helps us in our prayers. He guides us. He leads us into all truth, Jesus said. And the sending of the Holy Spirit is another proof that Jesus is not in the grave, he's alive. And then Peter says, not only the scriptures of God authenticate the resurrection, not only the sight of God's people authenticate the resurrection, not only the sending of God's Spirit authenticate the resurrection, but the securing of God's kingdom will, will authenticate the resurrection. Now, I want you to notice there, there are three tenses in these proofs. The past tense, the Old Testament scriptures, uh, the past tense, the, uh, the sight of God's people, the present tense, the sending of God's spirit, that that we experience today of God. And then there's a future thing that will uh, put all doubts to rest that Jesus is alive. And that future event is the coming of his kingdom. He says, uh, so he, he has poured out this on what you see and hear. And then in verse uh, 34, for David did not ascend into heavens, but into the heavens, but he himself says, and now he quotes another psalm, Psalm 110. David says in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, now there are two Lords there, the Lord, Jehovah God, the Father, said to my Lord, my Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. You see, when, when Christ came and presented the blood and, and, uh, and came to the Father, back to the Father's house, it says that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And here it tells us that God said to him, sit here 
at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Until I make your foes your footstool. Until, until I have deemed the time right for you to come back and conquer the world. And Jesus will come. He came to Jerusalem the first time on a donkey, Prince of Peace. But he'll come back the second time on a white stallion with all of his armies. He won't need his armies. He's going to conquer with one word from his mouth. And all his foes, all those who have resisted him, you, if you are even yet resisting him, all of his enemies, those who obstinately said, not thy will, but mine be done. All of them will become his footstool. They will all be destroyed. They will all be conquered. They will all have to forcibly bow the knee and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, we've discussed what the resurrection authenticates. It proves a lot of things. We've discussed what proves the resurrection. And there is, uh, Paul, or Luke says in Acts chapter 1, Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Now, Luke was a doctor. He was a man of science. And, and if you wanted to prove something to Luke, you would have to have good arguments. And Luke said he proved it with many infallible proofs. We've looked at some of them today. There are others. And I, uh, I urge you, if you're still wondering, is this true? Investigate it. Do some reading. Look at uh, the Morrison's book, Who Moved the Stone? Look at Josh McDowell's book, Evidence that demands a verdict, or uh, some other uh, good books that show that the resurrection is true. But let's assume that the resurrection proves these things we said, and that these other things prove that the resurrection happened. There's only one more thing to ask What should my response be? If the resurrection proves these things, and if the resurrection really did happen, what should my response be? Well, it should be the one that we read happened in Jerusalem that day. Uh, Peter says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. You know, you and I crucified Jesus. We weren't there, but he died for our sins. Had we not sinned, he would not have had to die. You and I are responsible for the death of Christ. Christ died. He came back. He offers you his Holy Spirit. He offers you himself if you would repent of your sins. And so what was the response? It says in verse uh, 36, therefore, oh, I'm sorry, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men, brothers, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Repent means turn around, change your mind. Take a new attitude toward God and Jesus and what he's done to you. You've been nonchalant about it. You've been negligent about it. You thought it didn't matter. You, you haven't given it any thought. Repent. Change your mind. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus came into my heart, he'll come into yours. 
if you repent and confess him as your Lord through baptism and you'll receive the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. Well, I hope if you've not made that decision today that you'll do it. I hope you'll do it now. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He rose again. He's alive forevermore. He's alive to help you through this crisis and, and every other eventuality of life. Jesus is here. He'll come and live in you through the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you things. He'll, he'll speak to you and you'll hear him. I want that for you. All of us at Agatville Baptist Church want that for you. Would you ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins, to come into your life and make you the person he wants you to be? Just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not doing this earlier in my life. I'm sorry, Lord, for the ways I've hurt you, the ways I've hurt other people, the ways I've hurt myself by not following you. And Lord, I don't want to go on that path any longer. I want to turn around. I want to repent. I do repent. Come into my life, Lord. Forgive me for my sins. Make me the person you want me to be. And I thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've prayed that prayer today, I hope you'll email us, uh, put a comment down in the YouTube uh, comment section or, or locate us on Facebook, Agateville, A-D, Ad, A-D, Gate, G-A-T-E, Ville, V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, all crammed together in one word, Agateville Baptist Church on Facebook. If you'd like to uh, catch up with your tithes and offerings, uh, I'm talking to the members of our church now, not, not anybody else. Uh, you can mail those tithes and offerings to Agateville Baptist Church, P.O. Box 323, Monticello, Georgia, 31064. Thank you so much for being with us. May God bless you until the next time we meet. God bless.